Again, shalom, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday night. Tonight is the night when I go on for Nativ, but don't forget Nativ is on other nights and some very special people come on, rabbis who really know what they're talking about. And me who sometimes knows what I'm talking about, but I pretend real well to, to make you understand that. No, back to the story. Please support Nativ if you haven't already as we go through this. But tonight I want to talk to you about Daniel chapter tw chapter 8. Last week, I gave you the traditional understandings of, Genesis, of Daniel chapter 8, and I threw in some questions, which I said would become a test items when we start tonight. But obviously, well, Lori said she didn't want to do any of those. She would turn off her machine. So I, I figure I will just go ahead and answer the questions myself. But anyway, here we go. So we're going to look at what I call uh, quantum prophecy. Now, by saying quantum prophecy, what I'm talking about, I don't know if you remember the TV show. I can't remember how long ago it was because I'm old, but it was called Quantum uh, Leap. And it was a show on that went and leaped from century to century to follow a, a specific act, what was going on. Well, Daniel has that same quality built into it. And so what I did in, Jan in Daniel chapter 7 was I gave you the traditional way and four other ways in which we can look at that chapter. Now I'm going to do the same thing with Daniel chapter eight. And I'm going to probably do the same thing when we get to 10, 11, and 12, because to be honest, all of those chapters really tie together. You, you, you gain a lot more if you're looking at it from an entirely different perspective. Remember Daniel himself He's 2,500 years ago, so he's talking about something that was yet future for him, but he would have no way of being able to comprehend what we're, what the world looks like today. So I wanted to give you that beginning or that understanding. Now, for example, last, when we were doing Daniel chapter 7, I talked with you about the Lion of Babylon. The Lion had wings, but I said it also has a precursor to what's happening in our in our time, and that's now we have England, which was also called the lion, and we have the wings, which are called the United States, and the eagle wings separated from the lion. The lion stood up, became what we would call a socialist. The United States today is attempting to return to that, that old bondage that they were in by some of the things that are going on in the United States. We talked about the Persian bear. But I also mentioned the next week, we talked about the Russian bear. Both of them had bear qualities to them. We then talked about the leopard, the four-headed leopard. We mentioned that as being the character called Greece, because Greece was divided by four generals after the death of Alexander. But at the same time, it also represents in modern day, the four Germanies. The first Germany was Charlemagne. The second Germany was uh, the Kaiser Wilhelm. And if you understand German, Kaiser means Caesar. So he was Caesar. The third Reich or the third reign was in the days of uh, uh, Adol Hitler, Adolf Hitler. And the fourth one started with Helmut Kohl because he declared that, that at that point, Germany was the fourth Reich. So we had this overlapping. Now we're gonna go through the same kind of thing when we look at chapter eight. Now, Daniel is writing and he's writing, or Gabriel, yeah, Daniel is writing. He's being talked to by Gabriel and Gabriel is conveying this information because Michael tells him to. So what we have is a story being passed down. Now, if you look at the very first verse of chapter 8 in Daniel, I want you to notice, first off, in the third year of Belshazzar's reign. So this was the year in which Belshazzar was about to be overthrown. And it goes on to say, a vision appeared to me. I, Daniel, after that, which had appeared to me at first, I saw in the vision when I stood, I was in Shushan. Shushan is the second uh, capital city for the Persian Empire. The first capital city was, was further east in Elam, but this one is in Shushan. And the reason it's there is if you remember King Ahasuerus, he 
helps makes the book of X Esther important. He had ha had a chair built for himself, a royal throne made out of gold, made out of glass. And his chair was so heavy and so fragile, he couldn't move it. So he built a palace around the chair. And so that's why Shushan became the capital. Now it talks about a, the river Ulai. Now the river Ulai, nobody knows where it is or if it is a river or if it's a stream. They just simply know it exists. Now, at this point in time, we we covered last week, we covered the fact that out of the four out of the single horned he goat came forth four empires or the div empire of, was divided four different ways. And from one of those empires came forth what we called the little horn. Now that is understood to be Antiochus Epiphanes. He was the character called the little horn. And for three years, he persecuted Jerusalem to no end. Then after that, there we had what we called the Maccabean revolt and all of the things that changed what was going on. But the little horn here, in Daniel chapter 8 is not the same little horn as in chapter 7. Chapter 7, the little horn happens to be in the nation of Rome or a part of the Roman Empire. So we have two little horns that we're now dealing with. And what we're going to find out is there's probably been a horn in every generation, just like there was a Messiah according to the Hebrews, in every generation. Somebody anointed to take the throne. We remember, I don't know if you listen to me or, or David, when we talked about in the book of, um, well, book of Isaiah, talked about Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a messianic figure and would have been the Messiah had he chosen to written a song declaring the greatness of God after the defeat of Sennacherib. You see, Sennacherib had an army well larger than 275,000 men. That was just his army, the Assyrian army. He had all of the nations around him, including Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. They were all a part of his empire. But 275,000 died and never broke into, the, into Jerusalem. So he was potentially a Messiah. So again, in every generation... The Jewish understanding is there is a Messiah that can come. But I also believe in every generation, there is a little horn. Adolf Hitler, I think, helped me prove that there was a little horn in 1938 because of what he was able to accomplish. And we'll go back to him later, if not sooner. I want you to go down to verses 9, 10, and 11, because this is where we really start getting into the understanding of the second the second prophecy that's going through this. He begins by saying, out of them came forth one little horn, which grew exceedingly southward, eastward, and towards the coveted land. Now that can tell us about Antiochus because that's the directions he grew. But it goes on to say, it grew also where? Up to, up, up to the host of heavens. And it threw some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. It exalted itself even up to the master of hosts. So we're talking about something that's more ethereal than terrestrial. We're talking about something that occurred that didn't occur in this physical realm. So how does one in physical form affect something that's not in this physical form, but in a very spiritual form. That's where we're at at this particular point in time. And so this master post, because of it, because of him, he caused the, what? He caused the daily offerings removed. So he's the one who's going to cause the, the stopping of the sacrifices. We know that Titus and Rome caused the sacrifices to stop. We know Antiochus caused it, them to stop. But how could this new character cause them to stop unless we're not talking about a, a temple here?
but we're really talking about a temple up there. That's where our story is going to come from. Not only that, it says the foundation of the sanctuary was what? Thrown down. Was the temple sanctuary thrown down or crumbled? But was the foundation totally gone? No, what we actually are seeing here is something that is going on in the heavenlies. The war that goes on here on earth is also equal to a war that is going on in the heavenlies. We have a heavenly war happening at this very moment in which Israel is fighting for its life. Now, Israel's angel, guardian, happens to be God, so we know that they will be safe in the end. But we also know that each of the nations has an angel, somebody you in charge. And that's what's going to bring this whole thing to Ezekiel 38 and 39. So I just wanted to get ahead of myself. So we're talking about something towards the host of heaven. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn to Joshua chapter 5 for a second, would you please? Because I want to talk to you about a character called Tsar Saba. Tsar Saba. Now, many people say he was the high priest. Actually, he wasn't. Tsar Sava is the name that was given by God to the prince of his army. That's what it's called. Now, in Joshua chapter 4, verse 14, he says, And he said, No, but I am the captain of the Tsar Sava, the host of Hashem. I have come now. And so Joshua fell on his face to the earth and prostrated himself. And he said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? So it is always meeting a character that he's never met before. And imagine yourself if you would have all of a sudden run into a character of supreme qualities. And that's what happened here. Now, some people say that the Tsar Saba was actually Metatron, which is the heavenly highest angel. If that's true, then according to the stories, this character called Metatron originally was Enoch from the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis. That's who he originally was. Now, as we're going through this, then what we're going to be looking at is going to be a battle that's going to occur between Metatron or Michael and Armillus. And Armillus, we're going to get to, and I'll talk to you about how he plays into this whole story. But I wanted, I've given you a, him last week, but I'm going to accentuate it this week. But I just want you to understand. So my question to you was, could this Armillus, this spiritual-like being, not that he was physical or not that he wasn't physical, but could this spiritual-like being create a spirit world that he could incarnate and do various things in the course of history. In other words, can this character actually be what we would call regenerated? In other words, go from being to being all the way through time. We know the character called Pincus will eventually become known as Elijah. We will know that there are other characters who are reincarnated in the in the Bible, listening to the to the uh, Kabbalists, the mystics, as they begin to talk about it. But I wanted you to understand this being is very much in tune with the occult. The occult has a great deal to play in world history, all the way through. And so, as we're looking at this idea, we're looking at a character called Armillus who with his occultic abilities is going to fight heaven and it's going to be strong. I want you to look at verse 11, chapter eight, verse 11 again, and let's look at it one more time. And I want you to notice three points. First, it says it or he, and I use the word it because that's the word used. It doesn't call him a he, doesn't call him a man. It calls him an it. It exalted itself it exalted itself up to the master of host up to the master of host so this character goes high because of it 
the daily sacrifices or the daily offerings was removed and the foundation of the sanctuary was thrown down. This is not cast down, but thrown down. In other words, it's not that the building crumbles, but it, it literally, he has forced it down. And we'll talk about that in a minute. While you got your Bibles out, I want you to look at Malachi, and I want you to look at chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 7. I hope you brought your Bibles, and I hope you know your Bible, because we spend a lot of time when we go through this all over the Scriptures, especially when you get into prophetic understandings, because you can't find all of your information straight out from our source. You have to go other places to find com comprehend or comparable or compatible verses but in malachi chapter 2 verse 7 it begins for a priest lips shall guard knowledge and teaching should be sought from his mouth for he is a messenger of the lord of hosts he isn't the lord of hosts he's the messenger of the lord of hosts so understand the lord of hosts is much higher than a priest much higher than a scholar he is ethereal in nature so Malachi understands that what he's talking about is not going to be talking about a physical human being. Now, I admit that the base place of the sanctuary being cast down could be historically the Temple 1 and Temple 2, but not with the addition of the idea of Tsar Zava. When we had the Lord of Hosts in there, we've changed the whole dynamics of this whole thing. I want to go to, again, not in our Bible, but I want to go to another passage. I want to take you to the Talmud. The Talmud is the writings that go along with their comp compatible to the Bible. In fact, there are oftentimes more explanations, stories that help us to understand scriptures. In there, I want you to go to Hagagi, Hagaga 12b. Now you can't, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. It says, Zuval, Zuval. Zaval abode is the location of the heavenly Jerusalem and the heavenly temple. And there the heavenly altar is built. So there is an altar in heaven. There is one. There are sacrifices that are made on that altar. That's what he was talking about early, where he's going to stop, cause not to happen for a period of time, sacrifices. And it goes on to say, and there, there the heavenly altar is built, and the angel Michael, the great minister, stands and sacrifices an offering upon it, as it is stated, and this comes from 1 Kings 8.13, I have surely built the house of Zuval for you, a place for you to dwell forever. Now, what he's talking about here is Solomon, when he built the altar here on earth, he also was, in essence, building an altar in Zuval, in heaven. So we have two altars. Why is that important? I don't know if you know are familiar with the word Shefa. Shefa is the word for, for abundance. And what happens is that when the offering is made in heaven, the abundance flows down to this earth. Now, when the temple was here, the abundance flowed down and out to the world, and it was much greater than it is today, and it's because of the fact there is no temple. So during the days when the temple existed, the destruction hurt the world because there was no longer that abundant flow. That's why there was so much famine. That's why there were so many controversies, so many wars. The second time it was destroyed, same thing. Now there is nothing here. What's going to happen when he brings down the throne, the altar in heaven, there will be no flow at all. What's the, the, what's the problem with no flow? Sanhedrin, and I think it's 98, will tell us the fact that there will be seven terrible years the last seven years. Among them will be famines and storms more severe than they've ever been. Now, that's the understanding of, of the scholars as they're going through and reading it. So this heavenly sanctuary is very important 
And the fact that the flow of energy, the abundance will no longer be reaching the earth, we can understand that there's going to be a lot of consternation here. There's going to be a whole lot of frustration as we try to understand what's happening. Now, I hope we can agree that the, that the affairs of man are influenced by the angels. But I also want you to understand the affairs in heaven are influenced by us. We arouse heaven, and heaven in turn arouses us. That is a very biblical, very Hebrew way of understanding scripture. Understand what you do has a profound impact on what goes on in heaven. Even if you think you don't have anything worth giving, do not fool yourself. Every miracle, every blessing that you perform, every mitzvah, all of those are added up. All of them. So understand it is important for what we do here on earth. Now, what's going to happen is the fact that spiritually, without Shefa flowing, what's going to happen is that the affairs of men, the wicked men, will become more influential because they will have more control over what's going on here on the earth. And so they will affect not only this world, but they will affect the other worlds, the world above us. Now, this little horn that's coming up that hasn't arrived yet, or at least we haven't seen, well, take that back. We don't know who he is. He may be here. The Jewish people understand that the Messiah is here now. They believe that he's living. If he's living, then I know the little horn is also living that both of them are there for us. Now, this little horn will become so terrifying. Not only can he attack man, but he has some powers over the spiritual world. Now, this character is called Armillus. Armillus is the Hebrew word that's taken from the word for Romulus. And I don't know how much you know about Roman uh, pagan history. Rome was built or established, according to the stories, by two men who had been two brothers who had been raised by wolves, Romulus and Remus. They ended up in Star Trek, but anyway, that's beside the point. the The idea is that Romulus becomes the king. Now, Romulus himself, if we go all the way back, and I don't know if you have the Book of Jasher, but if you had the Book of Jasher, you would find out that Romulus is actually an Edomite whose real name was Zepho, Z-E-P-H-O. Zepho was the grandson of Esau. So the city of Rome, or the nation called Rome, was built by the Edomites. That's why the United States is considered part of the Edomite kingdom. That's where we come from. That's why the Jews look at us differently. So anyway... This whole thing is about to happen. Zepho, now Romulus, now uh, Armilius, he is going to be the character that we're going to have to look at. I want you to look at verse 12. And the time will be, and, and at a time will be given for the daily sacrifice, but the transgressions, and it will cast down truth to the earth. The Torah won't be destroyed because the Torah is truth, but it will be cast down, not looked upon. If we go to Israel today, we think of them as being a godly people. Please understand I've been there twice, and I can tell you that there are an awful lot of people there that are not very godly. If you go to Tel Aviv, you're going to find the greatest pornography market. You're also going to find that they do a lot of things in terms of taking, squandering people's money by, well, anyway, lots of things. And if you go down to Elat, the southern end, you find the Russian mafia is operating out of Elat. So it's, a, it's not a nation that you would normally think of as being anything but godly's people. But that's not what you're actually looking at. Now, because of the sins that are going to go on there and across the world, and you can see the world changing, can't you? Since COVID, many, many people no longer go to church. In fact, the church attendance is down to less than 50% of those that used to claim that they were a Christian. Imagine the rest of the world. We're no different. If you went to Europe, you would find out it was even less. 
because the churches there are basically, well, they're there as museum pieces, not as useful temples. So casting down the truth then is about this religious hypocrisy that's going to be growing in its place. And truth will no longer be around. Truth will be, well, right now, if you go to listen to what goes on in, in Washington, D.C., you're finding out that most of everything that goes on, you can't believe what you hear because of all of the false statements that are being made from both the White House and Congress, it is a very difficult place to understand. And that same untruthfulness is becoming a part of the rest of the culture. We're finding more and more people are finding it harder to tell the truth. How long will the vision of the daily sacrifices be gone? Look at 13 and 14. How long will the vision of the daily sacrifices and the mute abomination? The mute abomination is the idea that there's no longer sacrifices, that the, that the, the world will become void of any knowledge of what's going on. Because of that, permitting the sanctuary and the host to be trampled. And he said to me, until the evening and the morning, 2,300 and the holy ones shall be exonerated. So after 2,300 days... Now, the, Antiochus was the one that everybody pointed to as being this little horn. Antiochus stopped temple worship for three years. If you can't multiply 365 times three, you only come to 1,095. So this character's going to control time for much longer than three years closer to seven and maybe even more now go to verse 15 now it came to pass when i daniel perceived that vision that i sought understanding and behold there stood before me one who appeared like a man so in other words he's he's trying to comprehend what's going on you're trying to comprehend what i've been telling you you're trying to put it into a picture that makes it makes sense to you. I'll let you know, this is my fourth time of teaching the book of Daniel, and this is the first time I've taught this. In other words, it is not something that you can simply, oh, I'll pick up the Bible and I will figure it out. That is not the way God intended it. You must struggle through. That is your purpose, to learn the Bible, to tend to the garden, in essence, to the Torah. Malbum, one of the great, great scholars of the day, says that Daniel did not know with certainty what these animals and their story really meant. Even after all he's been told so far, he still doesn't know or doesn't understand everything. How can I expect you to understand everything I'm telling you? But he goes on to say in the next verse, verse number 17, understand ben -Adam, now, when he says Ben Adam, he he has given Daniel the highest of compliments. Ben is the word for son. Adam, Adam, is the highest of all human creatures. So he is calling him the highest of them at this point in time. And it says, and understand, Ben Adam, that the that the vision concerns Moed Ketz. Moed Kets. That's the Hebrew for time of the end. Time of the end. That's what we're talking about. Daniel is charged with fulfilling the exalted mission of explaining to everybody about the time of the end. And here he is, still clueless, still struggling with what he's learned so far. The Greeks and the Persians appear to be headed for war at this time, as, as Daniel would have noted. But at the same point in time, it says that Daniel fell on his face. Daniel went into an even deeper trance. He started out in a vision, and now he's gone deeper into this vision. So what we're looking about at, excuse me as I go through this, what we're looking at is even deeper understanding and more concealed. 
if you will, than it was before. Now, I want you to look at verses 19 to 23. This is, this is a key as we go through. So he said to me, that's the angel Gabriel talking to Daniel. Behold, I am letting you know what will be at the end, at the end of the fury. At the end of the fury. We today would call it the tribulation. I'm going to tell you what it's like at the end of this tribulation, how far down it goes. For it is the end of time. This will be the last of time as we know it, because we will begin to roll into what we would call the period leading to the world to come. A ram that you saw, the one with horns, represented the kings of Media and Persia. And he begot, and the he goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn that is between his eyes, that is the first king. And he broke one and whose stead stood for, represented four kingdoms that will rise from the nation, but not with the strength of Alexander the Great. He, and at the end of their kingdom, at the end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have been destroyed, there will arise, after everything, then there's going to arise this person. Do you understand? This person is the end little horn. There are little horns all the way through, but this is the last one. And he's called, said to arise with a brazen face who understands riddles. Now, by understanding riddles, he is going to understand much of the Torah, not the revealed word of Torah. He will have not only that, but he will also have the occultic version of the Torah. He will have the understanding that, that Nebuchadnezzar wanted when he had his vision. He's going to have the understandings that were far beyond the normal man. He is going to be what I would call a genius, but not a genius in a good way. He will be totally evil. That's where he will end up. So when the transgressors have been destroyed, this king is going to arise. Now, since the Roman Empire was never completely destroyed, I would have to believe that these kings are part of a various European countries also. So I'm going to take you on a side trip for a minute. Persia and Greece, well, both of them are here today. Greece is Greece, but Persia is Iran. Iran has been a basic player for the last couple of years. They, it has driven Barack Obama crazy. Donald Trump seemed to put them down, but now with our newest president, they have risen to the top again, and they're flush with money. So we're looking at these two characters, Greece. But remind yourself, Greece's system was the same system as the Roman system. The Greek system is about I. It's about me. It's about everything that I want. That's what Rome was about. And if I look around today in this world, there's a lot of me. And not much us going on in the world today. So he begins by talking about these two, two empires, and it will be in the last days. Now, he says this first empire, the ram, had two horns. One was larger than the other. Well, if, if you go back to studying the history of, the, of Islam, you understand that in the beginning, Islam was founded by Muhammad. Muhammad, when he died, wanted to put his son in charge. Then he decided, no, I want to put in charge my good friend, my loyal student. It's just like Moses wanted to put Joshua in charge. Well, there was another group that said, no, we should all get a choice and a chance. So we came up with a split. Some wanted the son and his other colleague. They are called Shiite, or they are called the Sunni Muslims. 
the ones that wanted to have their vote and have a different person were called the Shiites. The Shiite nation or Shiite Muslim composes about 15% of the Muslim world. 85%, the bigger horn, is represented by Sunnis. But the smaller percentage wants to have control over the larger. This war that we're starting in Israel today really has less to do with what's going on in Gaza and more to do with Saudi Arabia. I don't know how many of you understand that the war was started by Iran for the purposes of keeping Saudi Arabia from signing the, the accord. That was the reason. You see, they can't sign the accord and still be Muslim. Not if everything is going against the Muslims in Palestine. So this war is nothing more than a ruse for what's going on. Oh, it's a real war with real casualties. But it was started by Iran, not for the purposes we think of. Although Iran will be very happy if the Muslims win and Iran is and Israel is completely destroyed from sea to river. That's the expression. Uh, Senator or no Congressman Talib, I think she's from Minnesota. She used that quote on the floor of the House, supporting. Gaza at the expense of Israel. So there's this war that's going on. Now, in his power, the brazen king, in his power will become strong, but not through physical strength. He's going to become strong and become wondrous. Well, if he's not going to use strength, how is he going to become strong? With his mind. You see, again, one of my favorite reads for the longest time was Adolf Hitler. I understand that Adolf Hitler was nothing more than what you would call a paper hanger. Actually, he was an artist. But anyway, back to the story. The understanding was that Adolf Hitler, in the course of time, understood that the German race was to be the perfect race. And he called him the Aryan race. And he spent everything he could to make that happen. But he surrounded himself with men of the occult, literally men who believed in all of the demonic things that you could possibly believe in. In fact, according to one story that I had read, at night, Adolf Hitler was often levitated from his bed. Levitated, part of what's going on. So as we're looking at this character, as we're trying to understand what's going on, understand that this character will be very wise and he'll be very wise in the occult. He will bring about the ending of the sacrifices in heaven through all the things that he's going to try. Now, we're not talking about God's and heaven there. We're probably talking about what we call Asiya, the world that we are in, and the world above us, which is the world of Yetzirah, the world of angels. But the idea is the fact there's going to be a secret connection between this character and what's going on here on Earth. If you remember Adolf Hitler and we looked at some of those reels of, of his speeches, did you ever notice how many people are there? How hysterical those people had become? When he said, Heil Hitler, and they responded in unison. There's stories of people that went there curious. But by the time they finish this, his message, they become so enthralled and so wrapped up in the message that they themselves became a part of the message. That'll be the same way with the little horn that will be coming. Even the elect may be deceived by this character. Even the elect. Because this character will have such brain power, such an oratory, such an ability. Look at the flow of energy. Look at chapter 8, verses 24 and 25. He begins there by saying, and he will prosper and accomplish. 
he will destroy the mighty and the people of the holy ones. That would be Israel, or would that be the angels? And through his intellect, he will cause the deceit in his hand to prosper. And in his heart, he will become proud. And in tranquility, he will destroy many. Understand this character and how he's motivated. It goes on to say in, in verse 26, and the vision of the evening and the morning that was said to you, you close up the vision, which for, will be for many days. If Daniel didn't understand it before, do you think Daniel understood any better now? And do you think Daniel heard everything? Do you think Gabriel told him everything that Michael had said? Or was Gabriel trying to make it so Daniel could understand a little bit about what was going on? That's what I'm trying to get across. Daniel becomes overwhelmed. And you see this in, in, the, in the last verse when it says, and the vision of the evening and the morning that it was said is true. You close up the vision. Now we have to figure out who you is. You is to close up the vision. So you probably isn't Daniel. You would more than likely be Gabriel. Gabriel, I want you to close up the, the vision, which will uh, be for many days. So he's given the information. There doesn't seem to be a chance for him to respond and ask questions. We're done. This is it. All I want you to do, Daniel, is I want you to write it all down, and I want you to share it with people. Now, the easy part was to share the first prophecies, the prophecies regarding the nations of Greece and the nations of Persia. This prophecy was much, much more difficult. I want to read to you another section from the Talmud. This section comes from Yoma 10a. And I may have to stop at places and give you some understanding since you don't have a copy before you. Now, remember, the Talmud oftentimes has dialogues between two famous rabbis. And so that's the case that's going on here. In fact, they'll be using proof scripture as they go through. It begins by saying, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi said to Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, and Ye Yehuda Hanasi was the writer of the Talmud. Okay, he's the one that put all this together for us. Rome is destined to fall into the hands of Persia. Rome. Now, Rome, again, could be Rome, Greece, the Christians, and Persia could be Iraq, Babylon, and Persia. Listen, fall into the hands of Persia, as it is stated. Now hear the plan of the Lord that the Lord has devised for Edom, for Rome, Greece. And the thoughts he has considered for the residents of Teman. Teman is a, is a small nation south of Saudi Arabia. It's the nation now that is in total chaos because there's a proxy war going on between Iran's Houthis and Saudi Arabia's Temanites. The war is going on constantly. In fact, just this yesterday and today, from Houthi, they are now firing rockets at Israel. So the war is expanding, whether the, whether we want it to or not. Iran is calling on all of his proxies. But anyway, it says, surely the youngest of the flock will drag them away, the youngest being the Houthis. Surely their inhabitation will be appalled due to them. And this goes back to the scripture in Jeremiah 49, 20, which I, when we get to Jeremiah, I want to spend some time talking to you about. Similarly, similar, similarly, my favorite word, Rabba Bar Hana and Rabba Yohan said in the name of Rabbi Yehuda, son of Rabbi Eli, Rome is destined to fall into the hands of Persia, which we've already heard. This is derived from the mean or by means of an of a forty or of inference. So it's in other words, they, they they've inferred from the text. Just as the first temple that was the descendant of Shem built it, Solomon, 
the Chaldeans, Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed it. And it was turned, and it turned the Chaldeans, ruled by Belshazzar, fell to Persians, who ruled Darius the Mede and his son-in-law Cyrus the Persian. Now, I stop for a second to let you know that the word Messiah is a significant word, but it only means anointed. And if you go to Isaiah 45, 1, you will find out that Cyrus the Persian was called a Messiah. He was anointed. So anointed isn't just specifically a character that we're looking forward to. Anointed are the characters. There are 38 times in the scripture, the Tanakh, in which the word Messiah is used, anointed. 30 of those times deals with the priesthood. The others deal with various people, including Cyrus the Persian. So anyway, tell the Persians ruled by Darius the Mede and the son of Cyrus the Persian. The second temple, the Persians built it. The Romans destroyed it, and it is not right that the Romans will fall into the hands of the Persians. So the story goes, Persia conquers Rome because they are the ones who eventually are going to win. That is the assumption. And the reason they're going to win is because, first off, the Romans destroyed their temple that they built for God. So obviously they need to fall. So there's a war that's going to happen between the Persians and the Romans, between the Christians and the Muslims. This is the war that we're talking about. So in contrast, Rav said, Persia is destined to fall into the hands of Rome. Rav Kahana and Rav Asisi, Rav's students, said to Rav, the builder will fall into the hands of the destroyer. Is that justice? And he said to them, although it seems unjust, yes, that is the king's decree. Some say that he is said to this, or said this to them, they too are destroyers of synagogues. All of the characters that we've read about, all of them are guilty. All of them have destroyed synagogues somewhere along the line. Who will have to be destroyed? All of them will have to be destroyed. Where does that happen? Ezekiel 38, 39, Jeremiah, or Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. The last battles. That was also taught in a Bereta. Well, a Bereta is a, an oral tradition that, that didn't make it into the Talmud. It's a, or part of the Nit Mishnah. Persia is destined to fall into the hands of Rome. One reason is that they destroyed synagogues. And furthermore, it is the king's decree that the builders will fall into the hands of the destroyers, as Rabbi Hoda had said earlier. Key, the son of David will come only when the wicked kingdom of Rome spreads its dominance throughout the world for nine months, as it said, as it stated, and therefore he will give them up until she who is to bear, to bear has born. In other words, the Messiah, the true Messiah, Mashiach ben David, until he has been born. Then the remnants of his brethren will return with their children to Israel. Why haven't all the Jews gone home? Because the Messiah hasn't come. If you look at the Chabad movement and you follow it closely, you'll find out that the reason they're in New York is because that is Babylon. That is where they are to stay until they're told to come home. That was the ruling from not this past Rabbi, Rabbi Schneerson, but from his father, Rabbi Yitzhak Schneerson. So they stay there and they wait there. Okay. So the events of chapter 7 left us with a little horn. The events of chapter 8 have left us with a little horn and a brazen king. All of these things are going to happen. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a world where we will find a final war. Our president is helping us get there. We find Edom is sp spending a lot of time and money on moving ships and planes and men to the battleground. Also at the battleground, Turkey has brought its navy down. They're going to have uh, 
what we call military maneuvers. The ships are off the coast of Cyprus, which is also where the U.S. fleet happens to be. And so he told them to get out of the way. Turkey is Muslim. So we have the Edomites and the Muslims in the ocean or in the Mediterranean. Don't worry. Russia has sent their ships to the Black Sea, and some of them have already come out into the Mediterranean. But don't worry, the Chinese have also sent their ships to the Red or to the Mediterranean Sea. All of this is going on at the same time. Nations are worried that this is going to spiral out of control, and they have good reason to. But if this is be the beginning of the end of days, what else can happen? I don't know. Daniel didn't write it down for me, so I, I, I'm, I'm lost at this point. I've talked for 50 minutes. Um, I know I've. some of you will listen to me again, and hopefully it'll help you understand where I'm at. I'll give you more later on in chapter 10, 11, and 12, but this is as much as I think you can swallow at one point. So I will stop at this point and ask if there's anything that you'd like to talk about. Any questions you might have or statements or you can even tell me I'm a nice guy. I don't well, care. Dennis, I'm going to say first, you're a nice guy. Great job. Great analysis. Uh, guys, if you're if you're not able to follow uh, maybe where he's going when he talks about the Talmud, et cetera, make sure you avail, avail yourself of Sepharia. Uh, you guys familiar? Give me thumbs up just to make sure if you know about, but use Safario, it's a great way you can, uh, you know, back up what he's saying and I'll actually read additional notes. But I, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, Steve, you, you really brought it to a place uh, of, uh, of reality. It's a very good possibility we're in that day. And I hope we are. I think that we all feel that way. And you and I, and the, those of us here in this room aren't the only ones that feel that way. But the days of the days ahead, we are moving into a new era. And many people that are not even like us are recognizing that. Muslims, uh, Christians, we all are realizing. Thank you. Thank you, Ross, for posting that. You know, we realize this is happening. So let's look forward to the days ahead where we're granted more understanding and wisdom from what you're teaching that now is beyond that. Does it make sense? I, I really appreciate what you're doing. Anybody else have anything you want to say? I'm out. Uh, Ross? Ross, you said you weren't going to talk. No, I said, unless you hit a point, <laughs> I preface that. Um, I just want to kind of highlight something that maybe kind of gets... Uh, overlooked because of the pace messiah in every generation okay and you covered this which um if if you understand what he's saying a messiah in every generation applies that the status has continued to be in a state that needs rectification from this point all the way to the time of the end, if there's a Messiah in every generation, then the rectification has needed to be done the whole way. Good point. Where'd you get that from? Oh, come on. No, seriously. You're, tell, you're telling me you're that smart? Never well, mind. Once in a while, I get a spark, you know, but. That's good. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> I kind of like you, you know, the light comes on once in a while. You don't have a yeah, the, the light goes on and there is somebody home. Uh, so. You don't have a source for it. You just thought of that. Well, I, I just, I, it kind of came up. If there is a Messiah in every generation, well, then I'm yeah, saying, no. what does that imply? No, I, I, I agree. I, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Yes, it does. Uh, you covered yes, it does. in verse or chapter eight, verse 23. One translation says that he will excel in ambiguous speech. You're not really sure. You think he means this, but he really means that. He'll be a great politician, won't he? No, absolutely. And last 
just a last little quick point. It said that the builders will fall into the hands of the destroyers. That does you understand what's being said here is those that build the synagogues will fall into the hands of the destroyers. That's another possibility. Well, absolutely uh, correct. And again, why will they fall into the hands of the destroyers? It boils down to the fact that they will be overcome overwhelmed by what's going on around them many people will lose their ability to think for themselves or will not find a community like we have here where they can express themselves and ask questions it's very very important that rod and this this organization continues because it's one way that we have of getting together and talking our way through i don't know how many of you go to YouTube. I go to it daily, most of the time, just to look to see what's going on with the war in Israel. But one of the things that I want to tell you is there are more pastors trying to give their spin on this, on this, what's going on here, taking it back and through. And I think the one thing that we lose track of is the fact of how many people are going to be deceived because their pastor missed the mark. And I hope and pray to God that I didn't miss anything, that I'm on target with what I'm saying, because there's going to be too much happening. I remember the day when I was in a, a Christian and went to a, a church, not mine, but a, another church, because there was a, a meeting afterwards that I had to go to. And uh, the minister gave the sermon on the, uh, the, the loaves and the fishes. And the little boy that, that brought that brought them all and, and the, the pastor said, well, you, you really have that all wrong. Actually, he got out his fishes and loaves and embarrassed everybody. So they all got out their fishes and loaves. And so that was the way everybody got fed that day. And no more than he had finished saying that, then the organist got up from behind the organ and says, I'm quit. I'm done here. And out she walked understanding that what she was understanding was not what he was trying to get across. And so there are times when you have somebody who sits in the seat, who makes himself as though he were, is not at all what he is. And so I bring the point to you, we can easily be deceived if we don't hang together. Do not want to hang separately. So anybody else? I feel like I've dominated the conversation. No, I didn't you, even... you have not dominated. Your words were very well selected. I, I really appreciate it. Thank it, you. It, it goes, you know, doesn't need to be repeated again. It's it was your spot on. Yeah. Anybody else before we go? Matt, thank you for coming to class. Lori, Hope you learned something. You. Yes. Yeah, I can't believe Lori doesn't have a question. I know. It's almost like maybe she's so gobsmacked, she's just went on to another class somewhere else. You guys are terrible. She's had, watching. I she's had, watching a YouTube video. Yeah, I had several comments, but you and Ross took so long, I forgot all of them. Oh, blame <laughs> us. <laughs> so, in other words, you're going to have to raise your hand faster. <laughs> thank you all right we'll talk sometime anyway so i feel good mary Anybody? Is, mary is still in our prayers yeah she just had her surgery today yeah yesterday. yesterday yesterday you're yep. a real trooper i'm telling you yeah what we see is the skeleton of herself and the drugs she's on but anyway yes. Eventually, she'll be a lot different. Well, she's happy. We know that. So yep. she can't figure yep. out how to unmute herself. So there you go. Any, oh, she unmuted herself and turned the camera off. Okay, Mary. <laughs> no, now she just muted herself. Anywho, guys, it's been great uh, seeing you all. And hope to see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. for our discussion in the Parsha, looking into the prophetic uh, elements of the uh it, i'm excited so it's gonna be fun shalom shalom shalom, shalom lila tov uh,